Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to week number four of Heschel, Human Rabbi Radical. It is wonderful having all of you join us, whether you are here uh, digitally or here in real life. It is lovely having you here. Uh, last week, we really jumped into the Sabbath, uh, which I, I think we appreciated and enjoyed and actually wanted to talk more about, which I'm happy to do. Uh, I did swear there was a quotation from the book, and I thought it was in the first two chapters. It is not. At least it wasn't because we couldn't find it. Um, I, I still couldn't find anyone who quoted it and gave the page, and I wasn't prepared to reread the whole book to find it, but it is there. Uh, so the line that I was thinking of is, the Sabbath is to time what the temple and tabernacle are to space. The Sabbath is a cathedral in time. On the seventh day, we experience in time with a tabernacle and temple represented as spaces, which is eternal life, God in the complete creation. So the Sabbath is a cathedral in time. That is uh, one of the takeaways. And uh, there are, I would imagine, probably into the six figures of people if not seven or more. So if you were to say, who wrote, said the Sabbath is a, a, a cathedral in time, would actually know it's Heschel. That if there's one quotation that you know from him, that's it. And it's the number so high in part because it resonates and is taught amongst Christians as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the the last little piece of the Sabbath, which I handed out last week, uh, the only reason I really wanted you to have that chapter was because of the name of the chapter, which is Eternity Utters a Day, which I just oh. love it. <laughs> so I want I want you to have it. The rest of it, um, it, it more than half of it is uh, quotations. You could write a whole dissertation on, on um, Heschel's use of biblical quotations. Uh, we're not, we don't have time for that, though there are a couple that I want to look at today in, um, in Israel, an echo of eternity. So that's the book that we're going to start with today, which, as I mentioned last week, um, is in some ways, I, I've always felt, uh, Heschel's response to himself of the Sabbath, right? If in the, if in the Sabbath he talks about Judaism as being religion in time, at some point you have to reconcile it to Judaism also existing in space. Um, that we have a, an idea of the sanctity of space, of Har Sinai, of the Mishkan, of the temple, and of course of Israel in, in, in particular. And so what do you do with that if you're so focused in on time? What do you do when we encounter concepts of a holiness in space? Uh, I mentioned last week as well that a friend of mine, uh, Professor Sar Sarit Katan Gribitz, who had a postdoctoral fellowship at U of T, uh, used to teach a course on uh, Judaism and time. She's also published a book on Judaism and time. And as it turns out, she's actually a JTS fellow. Mm. Uh, so they have three fellows who are responsible, among other things, to do community um, teaching. So I emailed the person according to the program, like, tell me about this program and how this works. Um, so we'll see. I know Sarita is in Israel right now. She's writing a feminist history of Jerusalem. Oh. Wow. Oh. Yeah, which is really interesting. Oh, listen. Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah. I think she'd be really, in, I mean, she's, she's lovely. She's interesting. Her husband's also a scholar. Um, they have, obviously, they have connections to Toronto, having spent a year here. I just, I don't know if she would use the microphone on Shabbat. Uh, so that would change things up and what she could do. And she's she's very fatigued and does not have a booming voice. So anyway, um, and she met her husband, just a fun story, at um, the universe. It, it's in Vermont. I think it's, is it Muhlenberg? That it's has- Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania, okay. Because I'm <laughs> So I think it was still in Muhlenberg, but it could have been somewhere in Vermont. <laughs> Has a really highly regarded summer language program. Bennington? Maybe it's in I don't know. Anyway, they're both there. One of them, if not both of them, were taking Arabic. 
<laughs> neither of them ended up using it like <laughs> scholastically they did even better they found each other so yeah. they got married um before we start looking at uh, a few different selections from Israel and Echo of Eternity, I just wanted to read to you a little bit from uh, Zelizer's biography of Heschel about the Heschel family's first trip to Israel. Uh, so they go for the first time in 1957, uh, and he, Heschel, is invited to participate in a conference. So that's what brings him there. I'm sorry, the date again? 1957. 57, okay. Hi. It's good to see you again. Just to see you. Good to Careful see you here. Better wires. place than last time. Careful little wires there. Yeah, that's definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great alarm. All right. Um, so he writes to the Zelizer. Before their travels, Heschel grew a beard. He told Eugene Borowitz, Borowitz being an, an important uh, Jewish philosopher, I thought to myself, and, I, and Borowitz was at HUC. I hate to say it, I get confused between him and Berkowitz, one of whom is Orthodox and one of whom is Reform. Um, but I think Borowitz was the Reform one, who he would have known from his time at HUC. Uh, I thought to myself, how will it look for you to go to Jerusalem without a beard? So I grew a beard. <laughs> like, and of course, one cannot even imagine picturing Heschel in your mind without a beard. Like he has the hair and he has the big beard. And yet he did it. At least he says, you know, like, like I grow, I, I joke about growing a beard during Sfirat to Omer because it's the Omer. I, the truth is I, I'm very happy to save the 30 seconds in the morning, not to shave. <laughs> And often, you know, it coincides with uh, hockey playoffs. So <laughs> a two for one. Um, continues, upon his arrival to the Holy Land, government officials and the media treated him like a celebrity. It's already by 57, he's a celebrity. He was a guest of President Zalman Shazar, who had been a childhood friend. Like, of course, you know, of course, he will childhood friends from Warsaw. Traveling through the country, Heschel met with distinguished leaders, including Prime Minister Davi Ben-Gurion. Uh, being in Israel in the aftermath of the Holocaust made Heschel feel strongly that the existence of a Jewish state was a powerful refutation of anti-Semitism by the global, global community. Uh, we stand at a climax of Jewish history, Heschel said to the World Council of Synagogues, like a branch plucked from the fire. Etc. Etc. Now he often referred to himself as being like a brand plucked from the fire, which is as self a quotation from Isaiah, I think. One, certainly one of the prophets. So, like we saw last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. someone has to mute. Yeah, mute her. Uh, the the yeah. Um, top left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a little hard to say. Yes. There. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're coming. Um, someone's known me since I was about yay high, <laughs> lower than the table. Um, so he had, had certain stock phrases, ideas that he was able to use in more than one setting. Um, notwithstanding his love of Israel, Heschel did not lose focus on the dialogue with the spiritual condition of world Jewry. The diaspora and Israel were part of a larger continuum. The land meant less than the spiritual strength of the Jewish people. So we're going to see more uh, in a moment. If Jews were not spiritually engaged, Israel would not mean very much beyond its territorial value. Right? So we think about how he's, he's late in Jewish history to be uh, a cultural or spiritual Zionist as opposed to a political Zionist. Right? This is 57. Israel's been around for 11 years. Uh, but you know, I think he, he would have found common cause with Ahad Am and others of his, of his ilk. Upon his return to the United States, Heschel told the rabbinical assembly that his awe about walking through the streets of the Jewish state was tempered by his anguish that most Jews didn't live a pious existence. The question is not how to make the state meaningful to the Jews of America, but how to make the state worthy of 2,000 years of waiting. And it goes on from there. Uh, he also, Heschel, uh, when... Uh, there was a question about 
joining uh, the World Zionist Organization, whether a United Synagogue should be a, a member of the World Zionist Organization, ultimately represented by um, Mirkaz. Uh, we think about Mirkaz and Masorti, they're actually different things. <coughs> uh, he was opposed uh, in part because he thought it politicized shuls and this and that, and he didn't want to get involved in the politics and things. Can you imagine? I know. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't fly today. No. No. Um, okay. So with that, let us look at uh, this week's reading on um, Israel. So this is only see when you hear and make sure I don't give you my copy. Okay. Um, we're here. And over there. So the, two on this side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have enough. If someone comes late, I'm good with that. Thank you. So this is uh, from, we'll begin at the beginning of Israel and Echo of Eternity. Uh, six day war is June 5th, June 10th. So we're actually right now, right in the middle of that, <laughs> you know, in our own calendar. It's the anniversary of the war, and uh, Heschel visits Israel uh, the next month. I don't know, as a matter of fact, I, I might get the impression that his visit is simply because in the aftermath of the Six-Day War, he wanted to go. I, I find, at least, um, his, his style here feels different than the other things we've read. Uh, and you'll tell me, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that because I'm going to you know, I, I put my finger on the scale, but you'll let me know how you feel about it. July 90, it's like a diary entry. Almost. Right. That's it the feels, beginning. It feels more like it's a biography of his feelings as yeah. opposed to uh, a view of the world. Yeah. Although it gets more into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Certainly the way he starts is like that. Right. And then the more he goes... Right. The more sort of, that worthiness comment, which was in in that book, this whole notion of being worthy is here. Yeah, as little as I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right at the beginning. So, yeah. July nineteen sixty seven. I have discovered a new land. Israel is not the same as before. There is great astonishment in the souls. It is as if the prophets have risen from their graves. The words ring in a new way. Jerusalem is everywhere. She hovers over the whole country. There is a new radiance, a new awe. They survived. So yeah. there's, there's the, the, the gratitude and the, the immensity of survival that he's honoring here. Survived the war. The 67 war. Yeah. That one. I, <laughs> that, you know. Just clarifying. Yeah. Oh, I see. Good for you. I hadn't known. Um, yeah, so I, I think that the survival piece is there. Discovered a new land as opposed to like your previous visits. Uh, Israel not being the same, the country isn't the same, the people who are there aren't the same. It's the idea of Jerusalem hovering, you know, the, the sense that it's how important it is for everyone that Jerusalem has now been, you know, reunified. I, I think, Rabbi, could this goes back to my my childhood when this happened and we were all gathered in the you know, college gymnasium to talk about it and donate money. The whole city was there. And for parents, grandparents, us, children, it was the first time that there'd been a war there because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm post 49. <laughs> He's not, but I am. She's calling you old. Yeah. <laughs> He's as old as Israel. <laughs> yeah. Two. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, what struck, but what struck me, Rabbi, was the sense of awe that we all felt in 1967 and the years thereafter is lost on the younger generation that we deal with every day because they didn't, they have not experienced this sense of awe that we, that he just, Heschel, Heschel is like, in my opinion, a, a stream of consciousness. He's walked into Jerusalem and he's walked into the old city and he's just awestruck by where he is. And that whole sense of awe is lost. The kids today, 
you know, think about, and I sound like like the grandfather that I am, but you know, they think of everything as existing, but it's not true. It's just not true. And they lose that in the conversation. I you know, I try to put myself through and I talk, I talk with some Bima sometimes. Um you know, uh, like a mental exercise kind of thing. And you know, I'm I'm born 1982. No, Israel was always very much a fact, um, yeah. as was ability to visit and go to Jerusalem. And I, I sometimes wonder what, you know, I try to imagine what it's like to live in a pre-state time, what it's like to live, you know, pre-67. <coughs> and it, yeah, it, it, you, it can't. Um, and the final piece, and this is something that you get from reading the book as a whole, and I want to put it in here. I, I want you to imagine sort of Heschel walking around Israel, going from place to place. And you know, Heschel has, I think, a, I don't think it's an overstatement to state that basically memorized all of the Nivi'im, all the prophets, yeah. right? It's not like he has to look up to find the right, it's just there. And so when you go somewhere in Jerusalem, you have the words, the prophets, I mean, really just ringing in your ears it's a whole other experience and just that the spirituality of that experience must be overwhelming you know like i've had moments i'm going somewhere and i you know i think of a line what have you reminds me something <laughs> but no it, it couldn't be even one one hundredth of what heschel's having when he does this um the great quality of a miracle is not in its being. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me at home. Uh, I'm, I don't think it's going to help. Just let me know if you can't hear me. I'm gonna, I had to speak a little bit more quietly. Uh, the great quality of a miracle is not in its being an unexpected, uh, unbelievable event in which the presence of the holy bursts forth, but in its happening to human beings who are profoundly astonished at such an outburst. So what's a miracle? It's something that happens to people. Remember, he's a very person-centered philosopher. Dare I say prophet? <laughs> he is you know, someone who, you know, that, it, that, that doesn't matter unless it has an impact on a human. Uh, a tree falls in a forest. It really doesn't make a sound um, unless someone's there to hear it. And on that note, do you know what the sound of one hand clapping is? Yeah, it's Buddhist. No. Oh, that's rabbinic. Oh, oh is it? That yeah. Buddhist. It goes like this. Oh. <laughs> it's one hand clapping. <laughs> um, that's rabbinic? No, <laughs> I'm a rabbi. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> he says so. And, and to quote oh. Hashel right now, having your reaction, my astonishment is mixed with anxiety. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Am I worthy? Am I able to appreciate the marvel? Right. So this moment that we said before, his being self-reflexiveness, uh, the stream of consciousness, Robbie, you mentioned, um, you know, placing himself there at the moment. Like this reads to me like a like a diary entry, right? Like this is something he, he he's sketching down while he's visiting, whereas I think later parts of the book feel more um, put together. I did not enter on my the city of Jerusalem. Dreams, endless craving, clinging, dreaming, flowing day and night, midnights, years, decades, centuries, millennia, streams of tears, pledging, waiting from all over the world, from all corners of the earth, carried us of this generation to the wall. Anything? Okay. Beautiful uh, writing. Beautiful writing, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, his fifth language. Um, and what I think is, again, relevant, it's particularly based on last week's conversation, his inclusion of times, right? Things that are you know, midnight, years, decades, and right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just things that have happened, 
but his focus on time as being sort of the essential unit of experience. Um, my answers answers I could only dream of you. Right, he's talking to the wall. To my people in Auschwitz, you are more remote than the moon, and I can touch your stones. Am I worthy? How could I ever repay for these moments? That's very heavy. Yeah. He feels this heaviness and the weight of all those who couldn't be there mm. and the weight yeah. of time being in this space. Sorry to, yeah. Yeah, to do it. Don't probably, you're probably, you're contributing actively to our conversation. <laughs> no, but I meant because it's time and space. It's, yeah. it's all the time of all these people being at this place. Well, it's interesting, the paragraph on page 22 that struck me, and that was that this is our land. This is the land of the prophets. This is not the land of Titus. This is not the land of Saladin. This is not the land of others who don't fast every year on Tisha B'Av, that don't long for its long for the return. Um, I just I, I, it resonated with me, that paragraph. Off of page two. Again, this is our page two, so right column, page two. Uh, Jerusalem, I always try to see the inner force that emanates from you, enveloping and transcending all weariness and travail. I try to use my eyes, and there is a cloud. Is Jerusalem higher than the road I walk on? Does she hover in the air above me? No, in Jerusalem, past is present, and heaven is almost here. For an instant, I am near to Hillel, who is close by. The person, not the street. Um, he's probably close to the street, too. Uh, all our history is within reach. Right. So being there, what it does, it connects them with people and with times, right? rather than an essentialness of being there, which is there. So, so what, what does he see that makes Jerusalem unique? We'll have, to, we'll have to keep reading. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and part of it is because holy things happened in Jerusalem. Well, it's interesting because I, I remember on our first trip to Israel, which we did with Cantor Kirschbaum uh, on, on a our Institute tour, they stopped before you entered Jerusalem. And the place that had a sculpture that all the kids could climb and everything. I don't know what that spot is. And it's it just as kind of, sang and, and danced. We sang and they yeah. danced and they and they said the Shahriyanu and, and it was it was very moving. Pastel? They, did, they didn't they didn't do it anywhere else. We went all over the country and they didn't do it anywhere else. And and there was no doubt most people on this tour. With Laura Kipa in Jerusalem, but not elsewhere in Israel, mm. I, me included, which is the only place I've sort of ever worn a kippa out in my day to day life. There's, some, there's something, something about, about Jerusalem. Yeah. And, I, and I, yeah. I, I'm trying to sort of place him in that position, yeah. especially in that position, and understand yeah. why is it that place, get, why is it that place makes you feel that? There's a Jerusalem syndrome, which is. Uh, yeah, that's. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> really? Yeah, 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 it's discussed. It has, has um, I think the Sims did something on it also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that you feel this somehow you get there and you feel everything is totally different and your whole life's totally different, right? And you start prophesying or or start, yeah, you know, and it can it's, be it's part of the messiah complex, yeah, the messiah <laughs> complex, and, and well, all of us. It's Jerusalem. Yes. Yeah, right. right. Then you get back to Tel Aviv and say, okay. That's, that, that's right. Yeah, that's the question is just is he suffering of that. Is, yeah. Or, or is I he, know, he well, bring and create? Yeah. I, 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 think, I think he walks down, he feels it because yeah, he, yeah. he, because Jerusalem is so embedded into Tanakh and he's, yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's all there. Yeah. <laughs> there. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jerusalem, you only see her when you hear. I I, I, I think that. is really interesting and because and what are you hearing? It's not like you're hearing kids crying on the street like Yehuda Amichai. Oh, I'm gonna have to find this poem. I didn't think about this before. Um, so I'll read the poem. I'm sure I can find it online. Um, you're, what you're hearing here 
is uh, it, it, you know, is not kids on the street or playing soccer ball. Rather, it's she has been an ear when no one else had heard, an ear open to prophets' denunciations, to prophets' consolations, lamentations of ages, the hopes of countless sages and saints, an ear to prayers flowing from different places. So Jerusalem has been the that which does the hearing, and what is heard is, first of all, from everywhere, but also particularly um, from people who have spoken there. Um, that's a great honor. Okay, here's the one uh, I wanted to read. I'm going to read the first one too, because I, I can't not. This was actually just called Jerusalem. Uh, I'll read it. It's in English. Honor. So this is Yehuda Amichai. Uh, if, you, if you haven't read his poetry, a lot of it is available in English. Um, but if you have any facility with Hebrew whatsoever, get it in Hebrew too, just so you can hear the, the beauty of it. You can do it. <laughs> uh, on a roof in the old city. Laundry hanging in the afternoon sunlight. Sorry, laundry hanging in the late afternoon sunlight. The white sheet of a woman who is my enemy. The owl, the towel of a man who is my enemy. To wipe off the sweat of his brow. And the sky of the old city, a kite. The other end of the string, a child I cannot see because of the wall. We have put up many flags. They have put up many flags to make us think that they're happy, to make them think that we are happy. So we can lots to unpack, we won't do that now. This is the one I had in my mind. Um, this is called Tourists. Visits of condolence is all we get from them. They squat at the Holocaust Memorial. They put on grave faces at the Wailing Wall and they laugh behind the heavy curtains in their hotels. They have their pictures taken together with our famous dead at Rachel's tomb and Herzl's tomb and on the top of Ammunition Hill. They weep over our sweet boys and lust over our tough girls and hang up their underwear to dry quickly in cool blue bathrooms. <laughs> Close the door, but I think that we'll take more than be a be. Yeah. Uh, once, this is the part that I'm thinking of. Uh, once I sat on the steps by a gate at David's Tower. I placed my two heavy baskets at my side. A group of tourists was standing around their guide, and I became their target marker. You see that man with the baskets? Just right over his head, there's an arch from the Roman period. Just right over his head. But he's moving. He's moving. I said to myself, redemption will come only if their guy tells them. You see that arch from the Roman period? It's not important. But next to it, left, down, and a bit, there sits a man who's bought fruit and vegetables for his family. Oh, oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. Yeah. You know, sometimes I, I think to myself, I could be a writer. <laughs> and then I read something that I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> you could do another course on him. On Amichai? I, I, I would love to. I, I'm not qualified to teach a course on Amichai. I need, sure. I could find some. I, I could, I, look, I could bring stuff. There are... For his most popular stuff, there's study guides out there. Um, I'm sure, you know, for a poem here, a poem there, because, you know, there's lots of Zionist educational material. Um, I, I will, I'll just say this. I was the kid in chat who took, I was the only one who took calculus, algebra, geometry, and OEC, both of them, and OEC, chemistry, biology, and physics. And I took English because you had to. <laughs> okay. Um, it took me a very long time to understand anything about poetry. <laughs> and I still don't really understand a whole lot about poetry. Um, 
the fact that I ended up in like a profession, which is really humanities, I find, and my parents find to be hilarious. <laughs> um, this is how we know there's a God. Um, okay. Uh, and she's more than an ear. Jerusalem is a witness, an echo of eternity. Okay, so that's the name of the book, Israel, an echo of eternity. Um, eternity utters a day, right? That's the, the chapter from the Sabbath. Eternity, of course, is time. But in Hebrew, we have uh, one word which means two things. In, in most of history, the word le'olam in Hebrew meant forever. Um, and really today, olam, we think in modern Hebrew is world. Mm -hmm. Adon olam, the piyut that we sing at the end of Shabbat, is probably not master of the world. It's master of eternity. Mm -hmm. The is adon olam asher malach. Starts, you know, who was sovereign, who was king, who was king over. <coughs> if you look, anyway, that's enough for another time. I love that line. Jerusalem is a witness. An yeah. Echo of eternity. And um, the language of witness, while we think of it often, actually, I think Christians use it much more than Jews. If you just go out right here and hang uh, left, <laughs> the column that's literally right there. I know it's on both sides. One's in English, one's in Hebrew. Is from Isaiah about Ateme Da. You are my witnesses. Mm -hmm. The people are their witness. And here, you know, it's Jerusalem who's a witness to history. Eternity. Stand still and listen. We know Isaiah's voice from hearsay. Yet these stones heard him when he said concerning Ju Judah and Jerusalem. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. Hearsay for them. But we have... You know, <clears throat> We have someone who, who was there, something. Um, it shall come to pass in latter days. He meets Sion, te te torah, var, sem, yushalayim, right? And Zion shall forth, shall go forth Torah and the words of God that from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide for many peoples. Nations shall sword, etc. <coughs> um, let's turn the page. Uh, so left side, third paragraph. This is a city never indifferent to the sky. The evenings often feel like colnidre nights. Unheard music, transfiguring thoughts. Prayers are vibrant. The Sabbath finds it hard to go away. And that last line was a, the kicker for me here. That Shabbat having a hard time disappearing. Um, there is a practice called a, a Malava Malka. <laughs> uh, which is a, a certain kind of gathering that happens on Saturday nights. And um, it's done to basically escort, bring comfort to the Shabbos queen as she leaves, recognizing that, that it's going to be hard for her too. Uh, right side of the page, uh, last paragraph. All men are created equal, yet no two faces are alike. So he is paraphrasing two very different sources at the same time. Um, one is actually a direct quotation from? Constitution. Specifically? The preamble. There we go. Um, I can't help it. Yeah. <laughs> and... We're I think, where is it? In the preamble to the miracles. Uh, <laughs> Behold these truths be in um, Anyway, uh, and the second part, yet no two faces are alike. There's a, a midrash. Uh, I think it's in the, in the, in the Talmud, I think it's in Sanhedrin, uh, which I've mentioned before that, um, you know, when a minter uh, mints coins, they're from one mold and all, they, they all come up the same. Yet when God creates um, people, 
Um, they're all from the same mold. That is to say, all created in the image of God, and yet no two are alike. And that's the same here. Uh, all days can be defined in the same way. The period of the Earth's revolution around its axis. Yet the Sabbath is conceived in a special way. Here, right? And I brought that up for obvious reasons, who are we're looking at also. We are called upon to respect all human beings, yet are all also called upon to revere our parents in a special way. Right? So he's setting up the argument here for, well, what makes Jerusalem special? Right? So, well, he's established. Judaism, we have an idea of something being the same as everything else yet special. And in our human relationships, we have the same idea. You know, there are there are philosophers, but there are very few of them who would make the argument that um, you know, every single person has the same, you have the same responsibility to every single person as you do to your immediate family. Um, that's certainly not a Jewish concept. And we uh, Jonathan Sachs talks about concentric circles of responsibility, right? That you know, our first responsibility is to ourselves and then to our you know, family and then your know, community, et cetera, et cetera. He talks about the, the shrinking of the distance between those circles that you know, in a modern age, when we know what's happening in some far off country, that we have a greater responsibility to them than we might've had in the past, yet our primary responsibility is still to our you know, closest circle. There are philosophers who think otherwise. Um, uh, What's his name in Australia? Peter something or other. Uh, he writes a lot about animal rights, among other things. Um, but he says, no, you know, there are, you might be the same, but you do have a special connection to responsibility to. Uh, and he writes, so this is page uh, four, our page four on the left side, in a section called The Widow is a Bride Again. I'll return to it in a moment. Uh, Jerusalem is, uh, yeah, Jerusalem is not divine. Yeah. Jerusalem is not divine, for life depends on our presence. Alone she is desolate and silent. With Israel she is a witness, a proclamation. Alone she is a bride. With Israel, alone she, sorry, alone she is a widow. With Israel she is a bride. So again, Jerusalem is not divine. Without us, she's not Jerusalem, right? There's the human-centeredness of it all. Where is God to be found? God is no less here than there. It is the sacred moment in which his presence is disclosed. Again, so it's about time. It's not about place. We meet God in time rather than in space, in moments of faith rather than in a piece of space. The history of Jerusalem is endowed with the power to inspire such moments, to invoke in us the ability to be present to his presence. Yeah. So it's not even Jerusalem, it's the history of Jerusalem, right? right? It's a step removed from the city of faith, right? Itself. That's how he sees it. That's how he sees it. I do not enter the city of David to visit graves or to gaze at shrines. I entered in order to share cravings welled up here, to commune with those who proclaimed, and with those who preserved the words we now read in the book of books, with those who declared, as well as with those who preserved, who sort of persevered in teaching us trust. So why is he in Jerusalem? To honor his teachers. Yeah. And who are his teachers? To connect with history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think his teachers here are the prophets. Prophets. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any of these these cravings that were well adapted, they couldn't be let loose, right? Except, except there. Except there. there. Except there. Except there. Yeah. In that he space. To mm -hmm. be there. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, here was no waste of history. Here you discovered the immortality of words, the eternity of moments. Right? Yeah, you go to Jerusalem because that's where you realize that specific moments in Jewish history have eternal meaning. Right? And there's a whole thing about, well, you know, if Jerusalem was most important, the Torah should have been given there, but the Torah is not given there. Right? And then, which is 
part of the arguments why maybe Jerusalem isn't like the be all and end all of everything. But when you're there, the moment of Matan Torah, revelation, has its eternal meaning. Right? We don't go visit as Jews Mount Sinai. We aren't a Jewish belief. We don't have a tradition as to you know, where it is, even, um, which is frankly probably a good thing. In, in that it's probably in Egypt as a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in Jerusalem, we have that opportunity for you know, the eternity of moments. Wherever I walk in Jerusalem, I am near a world in a state of trance, near a stillness that shelters eternity. Uh, towards the bottom of the page, second last paragraph. Uh, Jerusalem is called the mother of Israel. And she's also used as a synonym for Israel. Um, so the first one that was interesting to me, the footnote there is to Baruch 4.9. Anyone know what that is? So the, the book of Baruch, the Apocalypse of Baruch, or second Baruch, uh, these are not in Tanakh. These are part of um, you know, the apocalyptic literature. So this is, these are uh, books that were written in Hebrew you know, for a Jewish audience, if you will. Uh, in the intertestamentary period, so between the close of the, the Hebrew Bible and the start of the Christian Bible. So they are not canonical for us. They're interesting, um, worth, a, worth a read, you know, but uh, the fact that he is not only familiar with it, but actually chooses to quote it or to use it, it's, 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 for me at least it's interesting, like, he, he's not lacking a material to talk about Jerusalem, and yet he chooses, because I don't know where else a, Jerusalem is mother. Jerusalem as a widow is very common, um, you know, particularly like the, the Lamentations literature, some poetic, poetic literature. Mother, much less so. I'm say, aside from this, I'm sure if it was in Tanakh, he would have quoted Tanakh. The fact that he doesn't, it's not in there. Um, and I think as synonym for Israel, I imagine he, <laughs> first of all, it's not synonym, it's, a, it probably, it's, it's a metonym, uh, and I think he means for the land and not for the people, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I think he's talking about the, the, the land. Uh, we have never left Jerusalem, we've never abandoned the city of David, uh, for thy servants hold our stones dear and have pity on our dust. Um, next page. <coughs> Um, the first paragraph, just three lines from the end. Uh, you are not a shrine, a place of pilgrimage to which to come and then depart, you being Jerusalem. Wherever I go, I go to Jerusalem, said Rabbi Nachman. And yes, that is the Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Um, although I think he writes this before, like, Breslov Chassidim had their, their moment. <laughs> He's writing this as about someone who knows Hasidut, not as someone who is a you know, neo-Breslover. Uh, but I actually think that this idea, suddenly Jerusalem is not actually even a concrete place. Um, it's an idea. Right? You're not a shrine, a place of pilgrimage to which I, um, to which to come and then depart. Well, that's exactly what he's doing, right? He went to Jerusalem and he left. So wherever I go, go to Jerusalem, that must mean then, at least the way he's understanding Rabbi Nachman, it's an, an idea of Jerusalem, the idea of Jerusalem. I go somewhere because Jerusalem is this concept, Jerusalemness, right? Because obviously Rabbi Nachman wasn't always walking towards Jerusalem or pretending to. Um, Rabbi. And then, yeah, go ahead. I'm just wondering whether you said it's the idea, and I'm wondering whether he's really talking about the internalized feeling that he had while he was in Jerusalem that he's taking with him. Yeah. Yeah, and just read us the next line out loud. The next line? Oh. Yeah. Uh, Jerusalem, our hearts went out to you whenever we prayed. No, 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 no. go uh, up a line. 
Uh, oh, Jerusalem, all our hearts are like harps, responsive when your name is mentioned. Yeah, and you don't have to be there to hear the word Jerusalem. But obviously, being there has a power, and he's very clear on that. I want to take that away. Um, but it's a concept. And it allows you to connect with all sorts of things. Um, the next, uh, the next page on the right side of that page is uh, I can be powerful. Uh, after the quotation, uh, we have arrived at a beginning. The night often looked interminable. Amalek was fewer and Amun prevailed. For centuries, we would tear our garments whenever we came into sight of your ruins. In 1945, our souls were ruins and our garments were tatters. So if we're just already there, you know, the connection between missing being missing Jerusalem being away from Israel and <coughs> tearing when we would see Jerusalem in, in ruins and connecting that feeling, that experience with the Shoah. There was nothing to tear. Now Schwitz and Dachau and Bergen Belsen and, Tre and Treblinka, they prayed at the end of Atonement Day next year in Jerusalem. The next day, they're asphyxiated in gas chambers. Those of us who are not asphyxiated continue to cling to thee. Will he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Come to you, Jerusalem, to build your ruins, to mend our souls, and to seek comfort for God and men. We, a people of orphans, literally he, he is at this point, have entered the walls to greet the widow, Jerusalem, and the bride is a bride, and the widow is a bride again. She's taken hold of us and we find ourselves again at the feet of the prophets. We are the harp and David is playing. So what, what's going on here? What is Jerusalem in this section? It's a rebirth of, of feeling of, of a peoplehood because they are now able before it was just words, you know, to all those people who lost the ability to even go there. And he's, he feels the weight of all this on him, that he has to um, compensate for that. And what is Jerusalem here? To me, it's the intensification of his concept of time. It's, to me, it's, he is living this experience and what's welling up is all of the concepts because he later in the, some of the material you gave us for this week, also, or last week, I guess, talked about the symbolism and the important, or the, and disdains a lot the religion based on symbolism. So as I read this, it was, to me, it was all about welling up this concept of time and belief and not as much about the place itself. It just, it's, it's uh, Eric talked about it a minute ago. It's the intensification of feeling, just being there. And then we all have felt it. I mean, so, I mean, anecdotally, I can tell you, and I'm sure that um, Danny can tell us the first time his father went there. I, I know the first time my father went there after the, after, after World War II, he was, my father was with the RAF, through the RCAF, he went to Jerusalem in 44, and I happened to be lucky enough to be there when he went 20, 30 years later, and of course, going to the plaza was very different than what he saw in 1944, but it was like, like this, it was a re new reality. And it's all about the intensification. You've taught me the intensification of time as opposed to space. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned this in front of the questions because I, I have a hard time reading this solely as a metaphor. Like, we come to you, Jerusalem, to build your ruins. Like, just the language of actually coming somewhere 
and doing something physical like building ruins like I, I i can't see that strictly in symbolic terms uh, but then you know mending hearts hearts seeking comfort that you can do from an idea you can't build the ruins of an idea i don't i don't think so um and they also say you know entering the walls to greet the widow jerusalem and he plays on this the harp piece again we don't have to go uh um, next, let's turn to page six, on the right side. Uh, from the, the beginning of that, on the right side, the wall. The wall. At first, I am stunned. Then I see a wall of frozen tears, a cloud of sighs. Who yeah. writes it? I know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Palimpsets, hiding books, secret names. The stones are seals, the wall, the old mother crying for all of us. So that's back to the, the Jerusalem's mother now. It's the wall is mother. Stubborn, loving, waiting for redemption. The ground on which I stand is amen. <laughs> Drop mic, walk off stage. Um, my words become echoes. All of our history is waiting here. Next page. Round on which I stand is up. I don't even know what he means by that, and I love it. Uh, so page seven, right side. Um, second paragraph after the break in the middle. I walk in the streets of Jerusalem recalling sorrow, nights of agony, nights of grief, nights of the ninth of Av. Right, Tisha B'Av, right, when we lament the destruction of the temples. The reading of the Lamentations of the book of um, Echa. The house of prayer is a house of weeping. It is the night on which God himself set fire to the first temple and then to the second temple. Uh, know, just for me, at least, just the walking and the feeling and just the connecting to the text. I really did it. I also, like... I didn't. I didn't look it up when Tisha B'Av fell uh, in uh, in 1967. That's easy enough to find out. I did not get the impression he was actually there for Tisha B'Av. Not July. Uh, yeah, probably not July. Although this year it is uh, the very. It's on a Thursday. It's at the very end of July, very beginning of August. Um, I know because I have a camping trip, and Tisha B'Av is getting in the way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's 27th of July. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in 1967, not that like it really matters. Uh, Gregorian, 1967. Oh no, I'm in late. Yeah, so it was it was in uh, August, in the 15th of August. So I don't think he was there, but his writing makes you think perhaps he was. Um, Rabbi, can I say something? Yeah. I find this, his writing very beautiful and moving. It, seemed, it makes me feel like I was standing there with him uh, as a person who knows the history of Judaism with the destruction of the two temples, and he's reliving all of it in that one space and time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know it's just about seven, so I just want to read one more thing. Um, page nine, right side, after the, the quotation. For 2,000 years, we've been a people in mourning. An extensive part of our poetry consists of kinot, lamentations. Yearning and sorrow fill most of our melodies. Yet we are not alone in our grief. Whenever Israel recites the Kaddish in the synagogues and proclaims, may the great name be blessed forever and for all eternity. God's voice, we are told, responds. Woe to that father who has exiled his children, and woe to those children who have been exiled by their father's hearth. 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 So the religious consciousness of the Jews, the people being in exile, meant also God's being in exile. And the return of the people to the land is also experienced as God's return to the land. Three times a day we pray, may our, may our eyes behold thy return and mercy to Zion. 
This is why we pray not only for the return of the people to Zion, we also pray that our eyes may behold the return of God to Zion. We'll, we'll finish it up there. Uh, the next section, you know, pages uh, 11 through 15, really worth a read. Uh, I, I, I like the last two pages in particular, but it, well, we're only talking about a few pages. It, it's all good. <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. Uh, so next week, <laughs> next week is our next week. Uh, next week, next week is our last week. Uh, no, 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 the twenty first. Oh, we have two more weeks. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just, no, I'm, I'm I'm thrilled. Yeah, me too. I, th I thought it was. I thought we only had five weeks. We have six weeks, even better. Um, so you know, hold on to uh, last week's. Hold on to no religion is an islands in particular. If you want to spend a little time on that, there's also. Just some special highlights I want to get to, and uh, we'll make sure to get those. So uh, thank you for uh, letting me know, and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi.